Now, we turn to the book of Numbers, and here we find a strange story. I trust that some of you have had this experience as described in the book of Numbers. They speak of the building of a tabernacle at the command of God, that God commanded Israel to build him a place of worship. He gave them all the specifications of the tabernacle. It had to be an elongated, movable place of worship, and it had to be covered with skin. Need you be told anything more? Isn't that man? Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Corinthians 3.16 There is no other temple, not a temple made with hands, but a temple eternal in the heavens. This temple is elongated, it is covered with skin, and it moves across the desert. And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely, the tent of the testimony, and that even there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire, until the morning. So it was always, the cloud covered it by day, and the appearance of fire by night. Numbers 9.15 The command given to Israel was to tarry until the cloud ascended by day and fire by night. Whether it were two days or a month or a year that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle, remaining thereon, the children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not. But when it was taken up, they journeyed. Numbers 9.22 you know that you are the tabernacle, and you may wonder, what is the cloud? In meditation, many of you must have seen it. In meditation, this cloud, like the subsoil waters of an artesian well, springs spontaneously to your head and forms itself into pulsating golden rings. Then, like a gentle river, they flow from your head in a stream of living rings of gold. In a meditative mood bordering on sleep, the cloud ascends. It is in this drowsy state that you should assume that you are that which you desire to be, and that you have that which you seek. For the cloud will assume the form of your assumption and fashion a world in harmony with itself. The cloud is simply the garment of your consciousness, and where your consciousness is placed, there you will be in the flesh also. This golden cloud comes in meditation. There is a certain point when you are approaching sleep that it is very, very thick, very liquid, and very much alive and pulsing. It begins to ascend as you reach the drowsy meditative state bordering on sleep. You do not strike the tabernacle, neither do you move it until the cloud begins to ascend. The cloud always ascends when man approaches the drowsiness of sleep. For when a man goes to sleep, whether he knows it or not, he sleeps from a three-dimensional world into a fourth-dimensional world. And that which is ascending is the consciousness of the man in a greater focus. It is a fourth dimensional focus. What you now see ascending is your greater self. When that begins to ascend, you enter into the actual state of feeling you are what you want to be. That is the time you lull yourself into the mood of being what you want to be by either experiencing in imagination what you would experience in reality, will you already that which you want to be, or by repeating over and over again the phrase that implies you have already done what you want to do. A phrase such as, Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? As though some wonderful thing had happened 
to you. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, when he opens the ears of men and seals their instructions. Job 33, 15 Use wisely the interval preceding sleep. Assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled and go to sleep in this mood. At night, in a dimensionally larger world, when deep sleep falls upon men, they see and play the parts that they will later on play on earth. And the drama is always in harmony with that which their dimensionally greater selves read and play through them. Our illusion of free will is but ignorance of the causes which make us act. The sensation which dominates the mind of man as he falls asleep, though false, will harden into fact. Assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled as we fall asleep is the command to this embodying process saying to our mood, Be thou actual. In this way, we become, through a natural process, what we desire to be. I can tell you dozens of personal experiences where it seemed impossible to go elsewhere, but by placing myself elsewhere mentally, as I was about to go to sleep, circumstances changed quickly which compelled me to make the journey. I have done it across water by placing myself at night on my bed as though I slept where I wanted to be. As the days unfold, things began to mold themselves in harmony with that assumption and all things that must happen to compel my journey did happen. And I, in spite of myself, must make ready to go toward that place which I assumed I was in when I approached the deep of sleep. As my cloud ascends, I assume that I am now the man I want to be, or that I am already in the place where I want to visit. I sleep in that place now. Then life strikes the tabernacle, strikes my environment, and reassembles my environment across seas and over land, and reassembles it in the likeness of my assumption. It has nothing to do with men walking across a physical desert. The whole vast world round about you is a desert. From the cradle to the grave, you and I walk as though we walk the desert. But we have a living tabernacle wherein God dwells, and it is covered with a cloud which can and does ascend when we go to sleep or are in a state akin to sleep. Not necessarily in two days, it can ascend in two minutes. Why did they give you two days? If I now become the man I want to be, I may become dissatisfied tomorrow. I should at least give it a day before I decide to move on. The Bible says in two days, a month or a year. Whenever you decide to move on with this tabernacle, let the cloud ascend. As it ascends, you start moving where the cloud is. The cloud is simply the garment of your consciousness, your assumption. Where the consciousness is placed, you do not have to take the physical body. It gravitates there in spite of you. Things happen to compel you to move in the direction where you are consciously dwelling. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. John 14 2. The many mansions are the unnumbered states within your mind, for you are the house of God. In my Father's house are unnumbered concepts of self. You could not in eternity 
exhaust what you are capable of being. If I sit quietly here and assume that I am elsewhere, I have gone and prepared a place. But if I open my eyes, the bilocation which I created vanishes and I am back here in the physical form that I left behind me as I went to prepare a place. But I prepared the place nevertheless and will in time dwell there physically. You do not have to concern yourself with the ways and the means that it will be employed to move you across space into that place where you have gone and mentally prepared it. Simply sit quietly, no matter where you are, and mentally actualize it. But I give you warning, do not treat it lightly, for I am conscious of what it will do to people who treat it lightly. I treated it lightly once because I just wanted to get away, based only upon the temperature of the day. It was in the deep of winter in New York, and so I desired to be in the warm climate of the Indies. That I slept that night as though I slept under palm trees. Next morning, when I woke, it was still very much winter. I had no intentions of going to the Indies that year, but distressing news came which compelled me to make the journey. It was in the midst of war when ships were being sunk right and left, but I sailed out of New York on a ship 48 hours after I received this news. It was the only way I could get to Barbados, and I arrived there in time to see my mother and say a three-dimensional goodbye to her. In spite of the fact that I had no intentions of going, the deeper self watched where the great cloud descended. I placed it in Barbados, and this tabernacle, my body, had to go and make the journey to fulfill the command. Wherever the sole of your foot shall tread, that have I given unto you. Wherever the cloud descends in the desert, there you reassemble that tabernacle. I sailed from New York at midnight on a ship without taking thought of submarines or anything else. I had to go. Things happened in a way that I could not have devised. I warn you, do not treat it lightly. Do not say, I will experiment and put myself in Labrador just to see if it will work. You will go to your Labrador and then you will wonder why you ever came to this class. It will work if you dare assume the feeling of your wish fulfilled as you go to sleep. Control your mood as you go to sleep. I cannot find any better way to describe this technique than to call it a controlled waking dream. In a dream, you lose control but try preceding your sleep with the complete controlled waking dream entering into it as you do in dream. For in a dream, you are always very dominant. You always play the part. You are always an actor in a dream, never the audience. When you have controlled waking dream, you are an actor and you enter into the act of the controlled dream. But do not do it lightly, for you must then reenact it physically in a three-dimensional world. Now, before we go into our moment of silence, there is something I must make very clear, and that is this effort we discussed last night. If there is one reason in this whole vast world why people fail, it is because they are unaware of a law known to psychologists today as the law of reversed effort. When you assume the feeling of your wish fulfilled, it is with a minimum of effort. You must control the direction of the movement of your attention, but you must do it with the least effort. If there is effort in the control, you are compelling it in a certain way, you are not going to get results. You will get the opposite results whatever they might be. That is why we insist on establishing the basis of the Bible as Adam slept. 
That is the first creative act, and there is no record where he was ever awakened from this profound sleep. While he sleeps, creation stops. You change your future best when you are in control of your thoughts, while in a state akin to sleep, for then effort is reduced to its minimum. Your attention seems to be completely relaxed. And then you must practice holding your attention within that feeling, without using force and without using effort. Do not think for a moment that it is willpower that does it. When you release Barabbas and become identified with Jesus, you do not will yourself to be it. You imagine that you are it. That is all you do. Now, as we come to the vital part of the evening, the interval devoted to prayer, let me again clarify the technique. Know what you want. Then, construct a single event, an event which implies fulfillment of your wish. Restrict the event to a single act. For instance, if I single out as an event shaking a man's hand, then that is the only thing I do. I do not shake it, then light a cigarette, and do a thousand other things. I simply imagine I am actually shaking hands and keep the act going over and over and over again until the imaginary act has all the feeling of reality. The feeling must always imply fulfillment of the wish. Always construct an event which you believe you will naturally encounter following the fulfillment of your desire. You are the judge of what event you really want to realize. There is another technique I gave you last night. If you cannot concentrate on an act, if you cannot snuggle into your chair and believe the chair is elsewhere, just as though elsewhere were here, then do this. Reduce the idea, condense it to a single simple phrase like isn't it wonderful? Or, thank you. Or, it's done. Or, it's finished. There should not be more than three words. Something that implies the desire is already realized. Isn't it wonderful? Or, thank you. Certainly imply that. These are not all the phrases you could use. Make up out of your own vocabulary the phrase which best suits you. But make it very, very short and always use a phrase that implies fulfillment of the idea. When you have your phrase in mind, lift the cloud. Let the cloud ascend by simply inducing a state that borders on sleep. Simply begin to imagine and feel you are sleepy. And in this state, assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled. Then repeat the phrase over and over like a lullaby. Whatever the phrase is, let it imply that the assumption is true, that it is concrete, that it is already a fact and you know it. Just relax and enter into the feeling of actually being what you want to be. As you do it, you are entering Jericho with your spy who has the power to give it. You are releasing Barabbas and sentencing Jesus to be crucified and resurrected. All these stories you are reenacting if now you begin to let go and enter into the feeling of actually being what you want to be. Now we can go. Silence period. If your hands are dry, and if your mouth is dry at the end of this meditation, that is the positive proof that you did succeed in lifting the cloud. What you were doing when the cloud was lifted is entirely your business, but you did lift the cloud if your hands are dry. I will give you another phenomena which is very strange and one I cannot analyze. It happens if you really go into the deep. You will find on waking that you have the most active pair of kidneys in the world. I have discussed it with doctors 
and they cannot explain it. Another thing you may observe in meditation is a lovely liquid blue light. The nearest thing on earth to which I can compare it is burning alcohol. You know when you put alcohol on the plum pudding at Christmas time and set it aflame. The lovely liquid blue flame that envelops the pudding until you blow it out. That flame is the nearest thing to the blue light which comes to the forehead of a man in meditation. Do not be distressed. You will know it when you see it. It is like two shades of blue, a darker and a lighter blue in constant motion, just like burning alcohol, which is unlike the constant flame of a gas jet. This flame is alive, just as spirit will be alive. Another thing that may come to you as it did to me, you will see spots before your eyes. They are not liver spots as some people will tell you who know nothing about it. These are little things that float in space like a mesh, little circles all tied together. They start with a single cell and come in groups of different geometrical patterns like worms, like trailers, and they float all over your face. When you close your eyes, you will see them, proving that they are not from without, they are from within. When you begin to expand in consciousness, all these things come. They may be your bloodstream objectified by some strange trick of man that man does not quite understand. I am not denying that it is your bloodstream made visible. But do not be distressed by thinking it is liver spots or some other silly thing that people will tell you. If these various phenomena come to you, do not think you are doing something wrong. It is the normal natural expansion that comes to all men who take themselves in tow and try to develop the garden of gastamani. The minute you begin to discipline your mind by observing your thought and watching your thoughts throughout the day, you become the policeman of your thoughts. Refuse to enter into conversations that are unlovely. Refuse to listen attentively to anything that tears down. Begin to build within your own mind's eye the vision of the perfect virgin rather than the vision of the foolish virgin. Listen only to the things that bring joy when you hear them. Do not give a willing ear to that which is unlovely, which when you heard it you wish you had not. That is listening and seeing things without oil in your lamp or joy in your mind. There are two kinds of virgins in the Bible. Five foolish and five wise virgins. The minute you become the wise virgin or try to make an attempt to do it, you will find all these things happen. You will see these things and they interest you so that you have not time to develop the foolish sight, as many people do. I hope that no one here does, because no one should be identified with this great work who can still find great joy in the discussion of another that is unlovely. That is the end of Lesson 2, Assumptions Harden into Fact. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe and turn on the notification button for Lesson 3.